In this video, we're going to begin examining nucleophilic substitution reactions of alkyl halides. And these are reactions that have the general structure shown here, where we have the alkyl halide substrate. It's going to have a halogen atom, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, all of which are good leaving groups, reacts with a nucleophile. And the nucleophile is typically used as a reagent, sometimes in solvent quantities, sometimes as an ionic salt, sometimes as a neutral compound in one equivalent uh, to the alkyl halide, something like this. And what happens in these reactions is displacement of the leaving group X by the nucleophile. This may occur in a single elementary step or multiple elementary steps, as we'll see, but in every nucleophilic substitution reaction, we can recognize a nucleophile on the reactant side and a leaving group having been kicked off on the product side. And in fact, the leaving group can be thought of as a nucleophile in the reverse direction. So I like to think of nucleophilic substitutions as the substitution of one nucleophile here, nuc minus on the reactant side, for another nucleophile X minus that appears on the product side and would be the nucleophile if this reaction ran in reverse. In any nucleophilic substitution reaction, two things need to happen. The formation of a bond between the nucleophile and the electrophilic carbon and cleavage of the carbon leaving group bond. Here I've labeled these A and B because we're going to use these two ideas to distinguish between two possible mechanisms of nucleophilic substitution. Now most generally we could imagine this reaction going through three different mechanisms, associative, dissociative, or concerted. The associative mechanism at carbon does not occur. This would involve nucleophile carbon bond formation before the leaving group departs, but this would violate the octet rule, right? If you imagined that this didn't take place and the nucleophile just coordinated to the carbon, some kind of nucleophilic attack step, that would produce a carbon with 10 total electrons. So that violating the octet rule means this is not observed. Dissociative and concerted mechanisms are both observed. However, the concerted mechanism involves nucleophilic carbon bond formation and carbon leaving group bond cleavage occurring in a single elementary step. So A and B occur in one elementary step, and we see curved arrows for this right here. The dissociative or stepwise mechanism involves A and B happening in two separate steps, with B, carbon leaving group bond cleavage occurring first, followed by nucleophile carbon bond formation and a carbocation intermediate appearing in this mechanism. The concerted and stepwise mechanisms will eventually call SN2 and SN1. For reasons that will become apparent, we're going to focus on the concerted mechanism first, its kinetics and a little bit about its stereochemistry and how to predict products, and then we'll dig into the stepwise mechanism next. Evidence for a concerted mechanism of nucleophilic substitution comes from kinetic measurements of many substitutions. In many substitution reactions, the alkyl halide and nucleophile exhibit first order kinetics. So for example, we might measure the dependence of the reaction rate on the alkyl halide concentration and observe that it's first order. This is quite common. And we can do the same for the nucleophile, and it's quite common for the nucleophile to also B first order. So the reaction is second order overall due to the first order kinetics of the alkyl halide and first order kinetics of the nucleophile. This means that in the rate determining step, both the alkyl halide and the nucleophile are involved. And the simplest mechanism we can draw in which this occurs is one in which the nucleophile is forming a bond to carbon at the same time as the carbon X bond is breaking in the alkyl halide. So nucleophilic attack and loss of a leaving group are occurring at the same time. Because the reaction is bimolecular, two molecules, the nucleophile and alkyl halide, are involved in the rate determining step, and it's a nucleophilic substitution, we call it SN2. SN for nucleophilic substitution, and the two indicates a bimolecular transition state in the rate determining step. SN2. We can equivalently think of this as concerted or simultaneous nucleophilic attack and loss of the leaving group. And in this reaction, as in all nucleophilic substitutions, we can recognize the nucleophile. Here it's oxygen, O minus, donating a pair of electrons to form a new, new oxygen carbon bond. We can recognize an electrophilic carbon, which is the carbon connected to the leaving group 
and we can recognize the leaving group, which in reactions of alkyl halides will always be the halogen. Here it's bromine. So notice that we form the conjugate base of HBr, great leaving group, Br minus, and we form a new oxygen carbon bond with the electrons in that bond coming from oxygen. Carbon here acted as an electrophile, and so the OC bonding electrons were derived from the anionic oxygen, which is now neutral. The SN2 mechanism is nice, right? It's relatively simple. Single elementary step with nucleophile carbon bond formation and CX bond cleavage occurring in one step. There's an interesting stereochemical aspect to the SN2 reaction as well. It displays what we call stereospecificity. Stereospecificity means if I start with one enantiomer of starting material, say I've got a chiral alkyl halide, like I see right here. If I've got pure enantiomer of this chiral alkyl halide, say only the left hand, SN2 reaction of that particular enantiomer will lead to a single enantiomer of product. And, and this is an important aspect of stereospecificity, if I switch to the other hand of starting material, I get the other enantiomer of product. So concisely here, stereospecificity means one enantiomer of a chiral starting material gives one and only one enantiomer of product. And if I switch the configuration of the starting material, I get the opposite configuration of product. SN2 reactions in particular occur with what's called inversion of configuration. The configuration flips in a sense. This doesn't necessarily mean a change in the RS label, but it quite frequently does, particularly in SN2 reactions where prioritizations of groups generally doesn't change. The nucleophile and leaving group often have the same priority number. So let me show you an example of what inversion of configuration looks like in the SN2 reaction. Here we have HS minus. This is a nucleophile reacting with this electrophile, which is ethyl bromide, in which one of the hydrogens at this carbon has been replaced with deuterium. So now we have a chiral alkyl halide starting material. If we look at configuration here, the configuration at this stereogenic carbon is R. And it's worth pausing and verifying this on your own if you're unsure. After the reaction, S has displaced bromide through electron flow like this, and this is an SN2 reaction. And if we look at the con uh, configuration of the product here, we notice that the configuration at the car same carbon is now S. And more generally, the nucleophile sits on the opposite side of the molecule from where the bromine was in the original starting material. Notice the bromine here is on kind of the right-hand side of the molecule. The nucleophile appears on the left-hand side in the product. And this leads to a change in the RS label and what we call inversion of configuration. Now, to prove this reaction is stereospecific, we have to run the reaction with the other enantiomer as well. If we do that, notice now I'm working with this, which is the enantiomer of this starting material. The configuration here is now S. If I run this reaction with the same nucleophile, HS minus, I get this product. And just as we saw in this case, an inversion of configuration is observed. I go from the S configuration now in the starting material to the R configuration in the product, and the nucleophile sits on the opposite side of the molecule from where the leaving group was originally. This is inversion of configuration. Inversion of configuration occurs because the nucleophile approaches the backside of the carbon leaving group bond. This is known as Walden inversion, although more commonly you'll hear it referred to as backside attack of the nucleophile. The nucleophile approaches the backside of the carbon leaving group bond in the SN2 reaction. And it sort of pushes the substituents here into a trigonal planar arrangement, pushes the carbon leaving group bond off onto the leaving group, such that the transition state has approximately trigonal bipyramidal geometry. There are maybe four and a half, well, let's say, bonds at the electrophilic carbon in this transition state. We've got a partial bond uh, between sulfur and carbon. This is a forming bond. And we've got a partial bond between carbon and bromine, which is breaking. Notice also that the negative charge is shared between the nucleophile and leaving group. 
in this transition state. And I say approximately trigonal by pyramidal because there will be a, a bit of pyramidalization in the transition state if the reaction is exo or endothermic. For example, for exothermic SN2, according to the Hammond postulate, the transition state is more reactant-like than product-like. And so the transition state will have a more intact carbon-bromine bond, for example, and a longer and less intact carbon-sulfur bond. More generally, something like this. The carbon-leaving group bond will be shorter than the nucleophile carbon bond than general. Uh, in general, or, or less broken, we would say. The carbon X bond is less broken in these transition states for exothermic SN2 reactions. Not a point we need to dwell on it a great deal, but just worth pointing out is this is a, an interesting application of the Hammond postulate. The charges are also asymmet asymmetrically um, arranged in this sort of skewed transition state with more negative charge on the nucleophile than on X based on the fact that the transition state is reactant-like, and in the reactants, the nucleophile has a full-blown negative charge. Let's practice with SN2 reactions by drawing the product of SN2 reaction of R2-bromohexane with sodium cyanide. Now, the first thing you should do when you know you're dealing with a nucleophilic substitution reaction is look for the leaving group and look for the nucleophile, and specifically the nucleophilic ion or even the atom within the ion that's going to donate the electrons. You want to get all the way to that level when looking for nucleophiles. We'll return to this point shortly. This is an alkyl halide, secondary alkyl halide, and we see the leaving group here is bromine. This can form Br minus. It's a stable anion. Br is a good leaving group. Now, where's the nucleophile? Well, presumably it's somewhere in the other reactant, right? Sodium cyanide. But where exactly within this compound is the nucleophile? Sodium cyanide is sodium cation and cyanide anion. And this reaction will be run in some solvent or perhaps need in the alkyl halide. And so that ionic compound is going to dissociate into its component ions. Usually a polar solvent is used in these reactions to facilitate that uh, dissolution of these ionic reagents. And this will leave us with cyanide anion, which has a negative charge on carbon. That carbon is a great nucleophile. And so that can donate a pair of electrons to the carbon linked to the bromine. CBr bond breaks toward bromine. This is our standard electron flow for the SN2 elementary step. And so we know the product is going to contain a new bond between the cyanocarbon and this carbon highlighted in purple here. And everything else will remain exactly the same. The last thing to think about here is the stereochemistry. And here we're going to apply ideas about the stereospecificity of SN2 and the fact that it occurs with inversion of configuration. This means that the cyano group will be positioned on the opposite side of the molecule from where the bromine is positioned. So the bromine is currently pointed out towards us on a wedge. This means that the cyano group will be located on a dash behind the molecule, behind the plane of the screen uh, in the product. And this is a consequence of inversion of configuration, which occurs at this carbon highlighted in purple. Only this enantiomer will be observed. If we started with pure enantiomer of this, we get only this enantiomer. And notice that if we started instead with the enantiomeric alkyl halide, if we started with this alkyl bromide treated with the exact same reaction conditions, what would the product be? Well, applying the stereospecificity of the reaction leads us to the conclusion that the product would be the opposite enantiomer of the alkyl cyanide with the cyano group on a wedge. Notice this corresponds to inversion of configuration as well. The reaction coordinate diagram for SN2 reactions is actually delightfully simple. It's a one-step reaction, right? And so there's one transition state in which we have partial bonding between the nucleophile and the central carbon and the leaving group and that central carbon. We've got partial charge generally on the nucleophile and leaving group. And we've got approximately trigonal planar geometry with, again, this admonition that for an exothermic SN2, the transition state will look a little bit more like the reactants, will be more reactant-like. And notice this reaction is exothermic overall. We know it's exothermic because Br- is a good leaving group and the nucleophile is less stable than the leaving group. 
CN minus is a less stable anion than BR minus. We could use pKa's to justify that or structural stability factors.